Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today, your toaster wants to save its stuff. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Seth Nelson, and I'm here as always with my good friend, Pete Wright. Today, you're just stuck with the two of us, and we're going to talk about <laughs> things that people don't want to talk about. It's not death. It's not taxes. It's prenups. I have, Seth, a, an understanding of the prenuptial agreement only from the movies oh and you're a movie buff as everyone knows so Which means, it's true i am I, that means i am effectively ignorant on the prenup but what i know is they are uh scary <laughs> that's what i've learned from movies everything i've learned from movies is prenups prenups mean you're not committed to the relationship or you're trying to get something from your uh, uh or trying to protect your uh your goods and your uh, uh ill-gotten booty from your uh probably uh not good for you potential partner is that is that everything i mean did that we nail it no we got we got to back that up first off i'm going to get this out right at the top of the show <laughs> because if i don't as you know i'm currently engaged and i will no longer be engaged not because i'm married because she'll break up with me if i do not mention intolerable cruelty yes the best movie ever when you're talking about prenups and divorce and negotiations it was on our um one of our holiday bonus shows, we talked about it. Yeah. Um, yes. But the guy eats the prenup at the wedding, dipping it in barbecue sauce to just tear it up. So on the advice of counsel, do not do that. Oh, I thought you were going to I thought you were going to go the other way. Okay, good. All right. Well, no, at least we know. At least we yeah, know what but, the stakes are. You know, check your local jurisdiction. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. So let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. What is a prenuptial agreement? So a prenuptial agreement is a contract that if someone comes to me and says, I want a prenup, this is what I say. Here is what I believe you're asking me to do for you. To create a contract that will be valid and enforceable in the event that you get a divorce. Is that what you're asking me to do? And if the answer to that is yes, then we have a whole lot of work to do. And here is the concept. When you get married, whether you know this or not, you're entering into a contract. You have certain rights upon divorce. But in Florida, check your local jurisdiction, and throughout the country, you are allowed to enter into a contract that changes the law as long as it's not against public policy. You've got a confused look on your face, Pete, and you're a smart guy, so... Yeah, no, I do. I was uh, I was about to de describe uh, the confused look on my face, but you nailed it. Uh, I'm uh, confused right now. Can you define what it means to change the law in Florida? So currently now in Florida, if you get divorced and you have property... We will go through equitable distribution where we identify your assets that you own by yourself, titled in your name, that you own with your spouse, that you own with third parties. We do the same for your spouse. We do the same thing with your debts. And then we decide what that's identification. Then we go to classification and we say, you know what? Is it marital or non-marital? And then how do we divide it? If it's marital, it's split 50-50. I'm just using shorthand here. So this is this was exactly my my the whole concept like uh, you know you, we say pre prenuptial agreement and my mind says don't we already have laws on the books that handle this kind of thing yes and no i mean so yeah, okay. in florida and this is why it gets confusing so just listeners stick with me for a moment we're going to get to these questions that that i'm sure you're asked, thinking in your head but in florida if i have a savings account let's call it just a good old fashioned savings account. And it's in my name alone. And I get married and I never touch it. I don't add money to it. I don't pull money out. It just sits there and gets its little interest rate over time, over time, over time. In Florida, under the current state of the law, when we get divorced, that would be mine because it was a premarital asset. Okay. Easy peasy, right? But nobody lives their life like that when they're married. What they do is they're like, oh, I got a savings account. I got a little extra money. I'll toss it into my savings account. The moment you do that, 
And the money that you tossed in there came from your wages, which were earned during the marriage from marital labor. So the wages are marital money. And you've taken marital money, tossed it into the non-marital savings account. You've co-mingled it. And under the law, you cannot tell one dollar from the other. And therefore, it's all commingled. So even the value that was there before you commingled it, that becomes marital property. You've just converted it. Right. So I describe this as a little savings account, but now I'm going to change the, the, the hypothetical. There's $100,000 in this savings account and you throw in 20 bucks. You've just committed marital alchemy. <laughs> exactly. Which your spouse will love you for upon divorce. So that's the only thing they're going to love about you upon divorce. Right. So no one lives that life like that when they're married. They don't think about, hmm, if I get divorced, I better keep this little side account of 100 G's non-marital. Don't add any money to it. Okay. That's the law. But you can have a contract not to apply that law or change it. Right? That's what a prenup does. So a prenup might say any account that is titled in either one of our own individual name upon divorce is our money. No matter what you do with it during the marriage. Correct. So that $20 on top of that hundred grand is now a hundred grand plus 20 of your money. That's right. Because we've changed how we're going to deal with that account upon divorce. Okay. So here's the greatest example. An IRA stands for Individual Retirement Account. It has the word individual right in the title. It can only be titled in one person's name. Yes, you can have beneficiaries that if you die, it will go to, but it can only be titled only one legal holder of that account, whatever the individual's name is. In Florida, check your local jurisdiction. If you keep depositing money into your IRA during your marriage, and you're going to pick up on this quick, Pete. There's a non-marital component and there's a marital component because you're going to have money from before the marriage and the growth on that money. And you're going to have money that you put into the mar- into it during the marriage and growth of that money. And now I see the look on your face. You're like, wait a minute, Seth. I just asked you on that savings account if you can identify it. And it's a different rule for retirement accounts. Yes. Why is it a different rule for retirement accounts, Seth? Welcome to my world. (laughs) I'm so sorry. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because the law deals with different accounts differently. And it doesn't necessarily make intellectual sense. So this might be a great example of when to use a prenuptial agreement intelligently, too. Just practically. It is an individual retirement account. We're going to say in the prenup... On divorce, it anything, any gains on that account are my gains. And any money I put in during the marriage, the active appreciation, I'm putting money in active. That and the gains on that, passive, the passive gains on that are all mine. And all the money I had there before, all mine. Oh, and wait a minute. The house that I owned premarital. Yeah, how do you handle houses? You won in a divorce in Florida. If you owned a house premarital, you're married for 10 years. You never put your spouse's name on it, okay? And you go to get a divorce. A portion of the value of the house could potentially be marital and a portion non-marital. Because when you're actively paying down that mortgage, you're eating away at the principal, which means you have more equity. That could portion could be value. And there's actually a coverture fracture that fraction that we use to figure out marital versus non-marital. How, what was the debt at the time? What was the value at the time? What was the equity at the time? How much money did you put in to improve the property? Do you get that money back? And so literally, you're going to love this, Pete. There's a, um, in words, but in the statute, it lays out what the mathematical formula is. And of course, I, being a law nerd and loving Excel, created an Excel worksheet to plug in these numbers, right? Yeah, of course, of course you course did. It's... Of course you did. <laughs> but in a prenup, you could say, that house is mine. And when I sell that house and buy a new house, as long as it's titled in my own name, it shall also remain mine upon divorce. 
Interesting. Okay. So now here comes the rub. Your spouse looks at you and says, wait a minute. I have a good paying job. I'm going to quit my job because we want to have children. And we're deciding that I'm the spouse that's going to stay home with the children. And you're going to keep your premarital home. And then if we sell it and buy a bigger home because we have kids and I'm making a home for us and it's great for the kids to live in. And by the way, with your job, you travel a lot. And then we get divorced. I got to move my ass out. Because it's your house. Yeah, that's sure what it sounds like. That doesn't really feel like we're a team in this, right? Mm -hmm. And there's the rub. Because now negotiating a prenup is talking about getting divorced when you're, quote unquote, no longer a team or a different type of team. You're still raising children together, but just not in the same house. And there's a lot of hurt feelings, really raw. And like, wait a minute, that's not how I viewed marriage. And we're like, no shit, because we're talking about divorce. This isn't a conversation about marriage anymore at all. And you're coming into it from the spirit of being potential newlyweds. And there's a lot of joy here. And what you're telling me, Seth, is that as an attorney, you're going to suck the joy out of the conversation. No, that's not what I'm telling you. I am (laughs) telling you that a client has hired me to try to suck the joy out of the conversation and I'm going to do my job. (laughs) Okay. You're like the final <laughs> test for marriage. If they can survive you, they win. It's you're the brass ring, man. <laughs> oh god, that's awful. So, okay. So what happens then is it can get very stressful very quickly because the one side emotionally and I I've, I've switched from the topic of, hey, you can change the law, you can define how you're going to do a divorce to the negotiation of it and the emotionality of it. One person is saying, wait a minute, I don't feel like I'm going to be secure. I thought we're getting married. You would always want me to be secure. And the other one then says, so are you just hiring, um, marrying me for my money? That's the dynamic that we deal with. It becomes a lot easier to negotiate a prenup when both people have relatively equal financial status. Because if they're both financially secure, let's just say both parties have a net worth of $10 million. They are on their, they're in their 50s. They're not going to have children together. They both want to leave their life's work to their children from previous relationships. That doesn't have that same emotion because they're both going to want the same thing. Hey, We each have our stuff. We love each other. If we put anything together, if we buy a house together, divorce, we'll split it. Neither one of us wants alimony from the other because we can live off of our either earnings because we're still working or we can live off of our assets in case. And I want to leave my stuff to my children one day. You want to leave your stuff to your children one day. I'll come back to that point because those are death provisions, not divorce provisions. But that negotiation is a whole lot easier than someone who's just starting out who maybe someone has significant net worth or has a business that might grow a lot during the marriage and the other one doesn't. And there's a big disparity of incomes and the lifestyles they're going to lead and people get used to a certain lifestyle and they don't want to be quote unquote out on the street when they get divorced. That's a different emotional negotiations than the one with two people that both have $10 million. But but isn't it also a practical negotiation, too? Like at, at some point, wouldn't you want to just let uh, like what are you what are you going for if you're the spouse that doesn't have the the uh, the big net worth? Right. I mean, security, you know, at some point, doesn't the divorce process, alimony, you know, child support, doesn't that doesn't the calculation, isn't that what it's supposed to do for you on separation? Yes. It's supposed to work that way, but you've talked to me long enough to know that that's not necessarily (laughs) the case. It was a leading question. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So the other thing, what a prenup does and why it's not necessarily a one percenter type thing, right? That's what we're getting at, right? Some people are like, why do I need a prenup? We both don't have anything, right? 
Well, part of reasons for getting prenups, and this is the good and the bad, I'm not advocating people do or don't in this conversation. What I'm saying is, is part of the reason for getting a prenup is you define the terms upon the divorce, which means you shouldn't have a big legal battle and a ton of legal fees when you're talking about uncoupling your finances. And I said that very intentionally, uncoupling your finances, because in Florida, check your local jurisdiction, you cannot do a prenup about time sharing or kids. You cannot do a prenup about child support. So if you want that fun litigation experience and going to mediation and staying late and working on a weekend and then going to a trial and being deposed, you can get all that in the parent. Oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So this actually uh, is broadening my horizons about the prenuptial agreement. Let's go back to the couple that doesn't have a lot of the security built in uh, because their financial power is at a, at a uh, is out of balance, right, coming into. So how would you structure a prenuptial, a prenuptial agreement that actually works in both parties' favor to provide that security going into the marriage that they're going to be taken care of coming out of the marriage? Like, can you, are, are you setting up the, you know, this, the, the party that earns less is, is going to get a certain something out of the marriage before they go into it? Yes. So what you're doing is setting up what the financial relationship is at the end of the marriage. Sometimes I do it as well during the marriage. And here's an example of that is every month, one spouse will pay to the other spouse $10,000. And that money shall be transferred into that spouse's own individual account. And that account shall be non-marital money. Or one spouse will contribute uh, the maximum allowed under law for I'm making up a number 20 years to a spouse's IRA, right? There's things you can do to set up financial security in the future by requiring payments during the marriage. Now, it's a lot more palatable for people to say, yeah, look, we're married. He's going to put money into my IRA. We're going to hope that money is always going to be mine, whether we get divorced or not. but Hopefully we get we stay married forever, and I'm going to use it for retirement, just like here, and we use it as retirement strategy. Yeah, right. It'll it's it's if, if we stay married, we never have to execute the prenup. Then we both win because that means we've been financially successful and we're doing okay. Right. By execute the prenup, you're saying we never have to put it into practice. When I hear the word execute a prenup, I think about signing it, so it will be signed. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, but it's all right. Yeah. You know these legal terms. That, that aren't matching up with the real world terms and how we use it. So you can certainly set up ways to get financial security. And look, the things that break down a marriage are communication and things that people have trouble communicating about, raising kids, money, and sex. So, you know, if we can take off the table the money argument and have that communication up front, which is actually healthy for a marriage, so many people get married, they don't have financial conversations. So this forces a financial conversation. Okay. That is what I think is actually a benefit of doing a prenup isn't necessarily the document. It's the fact that it forces communication. All right. So Seth, uh, let's say I go out and I buy a new computer and I, I don't know if I want to buy the warranty up front. Um, you know, sometimes I, I think, you know, I'm a pretty careful guy, but maybe, you know, accidents happen and I decide I usually have like up to 90 days. I can go back and say, you know what, I want to get the, uh, um, the prenuptial agreement with my new computer. Um, can I do that with uh, a marriage? Can I get it after I'm already married? I got gotcha. you. Yes. In Florida, check your local jurisdiction. Yes, you can. It's called a post-nup. Post-nup. You're already married. The nuptials have been completed post after they've been nupt. <laughs> I love it. Um, that's awesome. So yes, you can do a post nup because um, in, in my experience, this has happened where let's just say somebody comes to me for a divorce. The big issue is money. And I say, listen, you're raising a child together. You've got children together. The big issue is money. What, and you guys get into arguments and people say stuff like, oh, it's my house. I'm going to kick you to the curb. And that makes people feel insecure. And then they want to get a divorce and this whole thing. What happens if we do a post up and we define 
the money relationship during the marriage and upon divorce. Yeah. What if we take what if we can take money out of the out of the consideration completely? We can. What if we resolve that? Is there anything else in your marriage that you like? That's right. And so when you do that, sometimes that helps save a marriage. And I hate the term save a marriage, but people are deciding to stay together because I've now had the difficult conversation with them through counsel, through lawyers, through a mediation. And we literally have signed a postnuptial agreement that said, you know what, let's take the money issues off the table. Let's agree on how we're going to handle these things. And then if we get divorced, fine, there's our off ramp. We've already got it covered. Now let's focus on kind of getting this back where it needs to be. So I've used it as a tool to help people decide whether or not they want to stay married. Now, here it comes, Pete. In the same case, I've done prenups and postnups. You do a do a, a double, a, a pre postnup, a double, a prenup, and then they get married, and I do a postnup. Is the postnup effectively an amendment of the prenup, or is it a wholly different agreement? It's a in effect, it's an amendment, but it's a whole new agreement. In the postnup, it will say. The prenup is null and void and is no longer a valid enforceable contract, and we're agreeing to set it aside. Assumption is, is because something has changed in the financial relationship for one party and they want to balance things out? You no, know, you're so nice to me, Pete, because I thought your assumption was going to be because, Seth, you want more attorney's fees. So that was very nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> you're so kind to me when we don't have guests on the Never. show. Never. <laughs> right. <laughs> So here's, I hope no one's keeping score. <laughs> here's the deal. And I'm going to back up to contract formation, just what everyone wanted to talk about today. Somebody ring a bell. If you are selling me your house and I don't know you, that's called an arm's length transaction. A willing seller and a willing buyer reach what they determine to be fair market value, money exchanges for an item, good services, whatever the contract may be arm's length transaction. Neither party has to enter into the contract. Both parties want to enter into the contract and a deal is formed. It's called the meeting of the minds. The lawyers draft it. Everyone signs it. You give over your keys one day at closing. You walk out of the house. You're not allowed to walk back in the next day because someone else owns it. Okay? Sure. Prenups inherently are not arm length transactions. One, they know each other. Two. They're getting married, right? So inherently, they're not. Therefore, in Florida, the courts will look more closely at how was the contract formed because we want to make sure there is no undue influence or pressure from one party to the other. So hypothetical, these are law school questions on exams that go craziness. And then you're like, oh, what are the defenses for this, right? Sure. Uh, you've been negotiating a prenup for six months, going back and forth, back and forth. And it is the day of your wedding and everybody is standing in the wedding facility, the church, synagogue, by the lake, wherever you're getting married and waiting for the bride to come in and the limousine pulls up and the groom comes out and says, haven't signed the prenup yet. Not getting married unless you sign the prenup. And it gets signed on the hood of the limousine. And then they walk into the facility, the church, the synagogue, wherever they're getting married, and they get married. Okay. That sounds like coercion to me. Or at least I'm under duress. I got a whole wedding party in there. I'm in my dress. Okay. High likelihood that's going to get set aside because it is too close in time to the wedding. So how do you prevent that? You, one, in formation, you have negotiations back and forth. You have provisions that the husband wants in and the wife did not at the first draft, but the wife gets some of those provisions in the draft document. That's a way to say, look, judge, we are being fair. This said she got nothing on my first draft, but by the eighth draft, she's getting 25% of my net worth. 
that's a way to show that we've been going back and forth and I wasn't doing undue influence. And we signed this before we ever sent out one invitation or a save the date card. Yeah, no pressure. There was no pressure that the wedding was imminent, right? And then three weeks later, a month later, we sent out the save the date card. Then we get married four months after that. All's good. Sure. Sounds great. Okay. Now, if I get people, which happens all the time, because you know what you do when you're planning a wedding, right, Pete? Absolutely nothing. My my wife made all the decisions. But, <laughs> exactly. Well, that's why you're still married. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're, you're like, right. No, we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. But here's what your wife was doing. Where are we going to get married? Who are we inviting? Flowers, dresses, bridesmaids, parties, flights, accommodations for the out-of-town guests, the gifts that you leave at the desk for the out-of-town guests. They're doing all these things. Nowhere on that list is a prenup. And if it is, it's at the very bottom. So these are typical calls that I receive. Seth, I got referred to you by a buddy of mine, and I'm getting married in a month, and I need a prenup. Oh, okay. And I say, okay, you're asking me to create a valid enforceable contract upon divorce. I'm telling you now that that valid enforceable contract will be challenged and most likely will be set aside because it's one month to your wedding. It's just too close. It's just too close. So I have a solution for you. One, we can rush through and hammer out this prenup and it will give you a level of protection or as I like to call it, a false sense of security because I'm telling you now, I think it's going to get set aside, but at least it's something to argue. Right. But then after you're married, after the honeymoon, come back to me and we'll do a post nup and we eliminate the pressure of the wedding because now we're already married. And it's essentially the the stuff you hammer out in the prenup process. It's essentially the same document, right? I mean, you're just doing the homework before. And I'm reaffirming that I agree with all this and that it was entered fine the first time. But guess what? It's fine now, even if the court finds the first one. Then it wasn't entered properly, which we don't care about anymore because it's gone. We have a post nup, right? Okay. We have a post nup. Then new spouse says, I'm not signing the post nup. Well, now you got a marriage problem. Because now you have an unenforceable prenup and a post nup that isn't getting signed. And then you're going to talk about divorce. That's just what, what's going to happen practically. I'm not saying it. So let's say the prenup and the postnup will get signed. All the, the prenup is tossed out because it was, you know, some too close to the wedding, too much pressure. Uh, then do we default back to the laws of the state if nobody agrees on the prenup? So this is my cynical joke. If you think about a divorce and you have a prenup and it says what one spouse is going to get and what the other is going to give. That is the spouse that's receiving their worst day in court. Because if the prenup is upheld, this is what they get, right? So if they challenge it and get it set aside, they might have said, wait, I can get a whole lot more. So the prenup's their worst day in court, which I like to call, that's my first offer, (laughs) right? (laughs) If you represent the other side, well, that's just the first offer. I know this is my worst day in court. I'm not going to accept your first offer guy that says this. So I'm going to sit there and go and try to get more. So how do you prevent that? I One might ask. Right. Great question. Glad I thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> In Florida, check your local jurisdiction. You can have what's called a prevailing party clause, where if Pete, you challenge the prenup and your wife has to defend it and she wins, you've got to pay her lawyer fees. Now we've upped the ante. Everybody's got skin in the game. Stakes. Yeah, we have stakes. So the other thing in Florida, currently under the current law, you're not allowed to waive in a prenup or a post-up for that matter, temporary attorney's fees, temporary alimony. So if you want to argue about challenging the prenup and setting it aside and all of these things and argue about what the money should be, And all along, you drag your case out for two years and you get paid temporary alimony the whole time and you suck them dry on temporary attorney's fees. 
And then finally the other side settles because like, I'm just tired of paying this temporary stuff. Let me just get this done. Right. So the way that I draft it or advise my clients to let me draft it is put in there the prevailing party clause and put in there some case law that says we're allowed to do it that way. Okay. Okay. So there's you got that's why you really got to know this stuff inside and out and check your local jurisdiction. Um, because it can be an expensive proposition. Okay. First on the culture of prenups, in your experience, what is the impact of a prenup on a marriage? There is, in my experience, there is, um, I've seen a higher likelihood that it ends in divorce than without a prenup. I don't think it's marginally higher. I don't, I haven't seen it where it's like, oh, you know, divorces are, 41% of marriages, people get divorced. But if you have a prenup, it jumps to 60%. That's how I'm talking about. There's other, many other factors that go into it. But the reason why it's a little bit higher in my experience, they know what the off-ramp looks like. It's not a question of what will I get? He's going to drag me through the mud. The litigation is going to go on forever. It's, hey, got a prenup. This is the deal. We're done. Right, right. So the, there's less fear, there's less fighting, there's less, oh, I don't know. I think sometimes those same marriages might have ended in divorce anyway without a prenup. It just might have happened quicker with one. Interesting. Uh, th- on the same side, maybe a, a temporary period of the marriage where you're living in uncertainty and fear that keeps you in the marriage might give you a little bit of the restraint to stay in the marriage and try to work it out. One could make that case as well. The, absolutely. There's a lot of reasons people stay in marriages for certain periods of time. One is the fear of what will happen if they get divorced. One is what will happen with the kids. I, I want the kids to not go through a divorce and live in separate households. I want to see my kid every day. And then right when the kids graduate from high school, the last one gets out and in college or right after our college, they parents get divorced. And then the kid's like, yeah, you guys weren't happy. You should have done it years ago. You should have done it years ago. Yeah. Well, um, it could also be the fact that uh, prenups have increased by 500 percent over the last 20 years. Uh, And that that could be a reason that prenups (laughs) are 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 showing a leading indicator uh, toward divorce. Yeah, (laughs) right. Exactly. And and they have increased that much. And I think a lot of that is that um, with social media and society nowadays, people are seeing more of these celebrity divorces and what's happening where maybe before they didn't really think about a prenup, right? Um, You know, Steven Spielberg set aside the prenup, man, it was solid, solid written on the back of a napkin, you know, Um, (laughs) you know, and then it was over a hundred million dollars. Now, I don't know what that did to his net worth. And I have another question, Pete, which I'm hoping you can answer. Oh, good. Unless there is drawings on the napkin, How do you know which side's the back of the napkin? Well, isn't it going to be written in the right? uh... No, I don't know the answer to the question. It's seriously like if you have a napkin that's just cloth or paper and it doesn't have like an embroidery, the embroidery should be on the front, right? But if it's just if it's just plain, which side's the back of the napkin? These are the things that keep me up at night. You use you use cloth napkins because you're a real fancy lad. But on on the you know paper napkins like I use, it always bleeds through, and the writing is backwards on the back. Oh, I see. But you're picking the front by which side you write it on, whether it's the front or not. That's a hundred percent. Okay. Yes, I got right. what you're saying. That's now. right. Okay. Yeah, so that's called self determination. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> hey, well, thanks everybody for hanging out with well, us. Well, hold on, Pete. There's one more thing I want to throw in there because um, people always ask me about. They come to me and say, look, I've got all this wealth or I want to keep the house or keep my business. There's the reverse side of this just real quick to end on. There's also debt. Oh, I don't want to inherit your debt through this divorce. That's right. I am not, you know, if you're running up bills on a credit card that I don't know about, I don't want to be responsible for it. Yeah. Smart. Yeah. Right. And so then it's like, okay, whatever debt's in your name is this or whatever's debt in your name is that. Or you say, I we're agreeing that we're going to have a joint or a credit card and the spouse will have authorization use and the bills will get paid every month. But you can put a cap on it or you can say every month. And then when they that that starts going, you're going to be like mm, cutting it off. So there's there's all these different issues. 
And then usually when you divide this stuff, and this gets really tricky, when you're going to divide stuff at marriage, we can always say stuff like, well, the money's easy. That accounts in her name. That ac- <laughs> The nups. Honeymoon. And you find this great piece of artwork that you both love and you want to get it and hang it in your house and, and just keep it and to remind you of what a great time you had. But both of you ended up loving the artwork, not much the honeymoon. And so now you're going to get divorced. Who gets that artwork? How do you know? Because it's not titled. If it's a car, it's titled in your name. If it's a bank account, it's titled in your name. And so some prenups will say, whoever paid for it gets it. So now during your 20 year marriage, are you really going to keep the receipts on everything that you wanted that you bought and squirreled them away yeah. in that little shoe box in the bottom of the closet? So there comes stuff like that. So you can still, this personal property stuff can always be a problem. We have ways to draft around it, but in practicality, are people really going to do it? Um, so there's a lot of different We're still human. nuances on that front. Um, but another thing that we do is any gifts from one spouse to the other during the marriage is deemed to be non-marital. In Florida, it's marital. We've talked about this, Pete. Diamond engagement ring before marriage, non-marital. Matching earrings on first anniversary, marital, they're worth $1,000. Someone gets the earrings, the other one gets 500 bucks. Here, earrings for the anniversary, given, done. They're hers. You don't get the 500 bucks back, right? So um, there's a lot of little nuances um, to think about um, in, in pre and post nups. Pre and post nups. Uh, thank you, Seth, for the education. You've broadened my horizons, sir. You have broadened. They are broadened about the nups. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. We sure appreciate you. And uh, we will be back right here again next week on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, How to Split a Toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.